Mura, Countach, Diablo, Aventador. These are the names you think of when you think of Lamborghini. Today, I'm not bringing you any of those. Instead, I'm bringing you this, a 1973 Lamborghini Espada. Yes, the Lamborghini Espada. In the world of V12 Lamborghinis, this is the one you forgot about. Actually, it's the one you never knew existed in the first place, but over the next few minutes, you're going to learn everything you need to know about one of the strangest Lamborghinis ever made. Before we go any further, I should mention that I'm driving this Espada in Dubai, in the United Arab Emirates, courtesy of Tamini Classics, which is an exotic car dealer here with an amazing inventory and some wonderful people. Now, the inventory is so amazing that it was incredibly hard to choose what car to film. I spent hours trying to design and I passed up some true classics so I could bring you the tale of one of the strangest Lamborghinis in the world. So let's discuss it. The Espada was made from 1968 to 1978, came out just two years after the Mura. But while the Mura was getting all the glamour as the V12 sports car, the Espada also had a V12, except it had four seats and the engine was in the front. Think of this as the Ferrari FF, while the Mura was more like the Aventador or the 488. Lamborghini made about 1,200 Espadas over the time period that it was built, and this one had all of 321 horsepower when it was new 44 years ago. So today I'm going to show you around the Espada and I'm going to show you all of the unusual quirks and weird features of a very unusual, quirky, and weird car. Then I'm going to get behind the wheel and I'm going to take the weirdest Lamborghini out for a drive and then I'm going to give it a Doug score. And for more of my thoughts on the Espada experience, go to autotrader.com slash oversteer by clicking the link below. Now I'm going to start back here with my favorite part about the Espada, and that is the fact that this isn't just a Lamborghini, it's also a hatchback. Yes, that's right, the rear glass opens up, this car doesn't have a trunk, it really is a hatchback. To open it, you pull a little lever inside next to the driver's seat, a little bit behind it, and then it pops open and you can open it right up. The rear glass is really heavy, but it stands in place without a prop if your Espada is well maintained and the struts are working. Now interestingly, the fact that this car is a hatchback isn't the most interesting thing about the rear of this car. No, no, there are two far more interesting things to me, one of which is that there is additional glass down here. In other words, there's a steeply raked glass that you can lift up in the back of the car, and then there's another basically vertical glass below it. Does that remind you of anything? How about the Toyota Prius? You thought the Toyota Prius pioneered that? Maybe the Pontiac Aztec? No, no. It was in the Lamborghini Espada first. Your visibility is bisected by this giant thing here, and you look out the mirror and you see this glass and the secondary glass. Now this glass down here doesn't actually open, unlike in the Prius where the entire thing lifts up, it's fixed in place. The other interesting thing about the rear of this car, that would be the fact that it has a cargo cover. Folks, this is a Lamborghini with four seats, a hatchback, and a cargo cover. If you needed any other proof that the 70s were weird, here it is. Now, the interesting thing about the cargo cover in this car is not only does it retract like a cargo cover in, I don't know, a Volkswagen Golf, but it buttons into place. If you want to close it, you just pull it and then you just button it and then it's stuck there and it won't move and no one can see what you're transporting in your Espada. Next up, before I move inside, there are a couple of other interesting quirks on the outside of this car, starting with the name. Now, Lamborghini is always naming its cars after bulls and bullfighting and bullfighting terms, and this one is no different. Espada is Spanish for sword, as in the sword the matador would use during a bullfight. That's not all that interesting. Usually I don't care that much about car names, but check this out. Look at that badge on the rear fender back there. You'll notice it says Espada and it's also a sword. It's kind of cool. I really like how that looks and now you know why it's like that. Another interesting exterior quirk, this car has two fuel doors, two gas caps on the outside of the car. Except where are they? I'll give you a minute to look around, see if you can figure it out. No, I'm sorry, you couldn't figure it out. And in fact, no one can because they're hidden inside this little thing that looks like a vent. You pull up the front half and it's actually a fuel door. The rear half is just fake. It's basically just there for style and to contain the fuel door. And the crazy thing is, of course, that there is one on both sides. I already showed you the driver's side fuel door and here is the passenger side fuel door. You can fill this car up on either side. So when you're driving an Espada, you don't have to worry about which side the fuel door is on when you're pulling up to a gas station. Now, there are two fuel tanks, but the tanks are 
connected. So you don't have to worry about filling up one side of the car and later filling up another side of the car or one tank going dead and having to switch to another tank. It's actually not that difficult. Next up, a few quirks in the front. Now the hood and the engine, they're not all that quirky. The hood is front hinged. When you open it up, you get to see the gorgeous Lamborghini engine. There's nothing especially weird about it, but I'll give you a second to gawk at the best Italy had to offer in the 1970s, or at least one of the best. Also interesting up front is this antenna, not hidden or placed to the side, but mounted right in the middle of the car's roof, sort of screwing up the car's lines. Imagine if they did that with the Aventador. But remember, radio reception was important as this was the touring Lamborghini, and for more proof of that, we go back to the cargo area. Something else interesting in the trunk besides just the cargo cover, how about the fact that when you lift up the trunk mat, there's a spare tire, not just your typical crappy Italian car spare tire, but rather a full-size spare tire with an actual wheel. So each car was delivered with five tires and five wheels. When you really think about it, that makes sense. This is the four-seater Lamborghini, the touring car with the big trunk, the hatchback and the cargo cover. This is the car you were supposed to take on long trips. And when you were on one of those trips, if it got interrupted with a flat tire, you weren't going to stop and wait for some weird Italian car surface to come. You were going to just change the tire and continue along your way. Now, for proof that this was the touring car Lamborghini designed for long trips, all you have to do is get inside the interior where you will find some impressive luxury features and some rather odd ones, starting with the passenger side footwell where there is a movable footrest. I don't think I've ever seen this in any car, Bentley Rolls Royce, but here it is in a Lamborghini. You pop it down and then you can rest your feet there if you're on a road trip and they need a rest. Interestingly, despite this car's luxury car status, it only had a little bit of wood in the interior. This is a surprise since wood was a big luxury car touch in the 1970s, but in this car, there's a little bit of wood on the gear lever, which is a common spot for it. More wood on the steering wheel, also common. And then there was a little bit of wood on the door panel. It had no purpose. There was no cargo area behind it. It was just some wood they stuck there, and that's basically all the wood in the entire cabin. I don't know why they felt they had to put it there. I don't know why they they chose that spot or that shape, but there's some wood there. Now you see right above the wood, there's a little cutout. Even though this car has power windows, that little cutout there is for manually rolling down the windows if the power windows fail. Apparently there was a tool that came with this car's toolkit. You stick it in there and then you can crank the windows. I find this kind of hilarious. Lamborghini knew their electronics in the 70s were so questionable that they included a fail safe for when the window switches failed. You can just roll down your window. Also interesting in the door panel, which by the way is covered in leather and chrome, like the luxury car that this is, is the door handle itself. It's not a traditional door handle. Instead, it's this leather and chrome wrapped little piece on the armrest. You pull it up and then the door opens and you can get out. Now, a couple of other interesting items that made it very clear you were driving in a serious luxury car. How about the fact that the steering wheel in this car tilts? Now, I am saying that like I'm incredulous because I am. If you've ever driven in any 70s Italian car, you know that the driving position is always tremendously compromised. The steering wheel doesn't move anywhere, and if you're tall, you're just kind of screwed. But in this car, the steering wheel tilts. But the interesting thing about this is Lamborghini didn't really know how to make a tilt steering wheel, so they made it in the simplest and most bizarre way possible. You know how to tilt the steering wheel in a Lamborghini Espada? You just yank it really, really hard, and then it tilts down. You want it to go up? Yank it really, really hard, and then it goes up and apparently it locks into place, but then if you yank it, it moves again. I don't know, I don't have a lot of confidence in this thing, but it works and apparently it's how you're supposed to do it. Another unusual and amazing luxury feature, you've heard of front floor mats, of course, and rear floor mats, but this car, has a side floor mat. Lamborghini wanted to conceal the unfinished nature of the floor, so they actually have a side floor mat that Velcros into place next to the seats in addition to the front and rear floor mats. I've never seen this before in any other car, but it is a nice little luxury touch. And of course, this car's grand touring capabilities would be nothing if there weren't back seats. So you could take the whole family on a grand tour. So of course, there are, and this will surprise you, the back seats are actually pretty easy to get into and pretty roomy. I've already moved the front seat forward. Watch this. Did you ever think it would be this easy to get into the back of a Lamborghini. Did you ever think there would be a back of a Lamborghini to get into? But I'm here, and if I put the seat back, oh, well, it's a little tight in the sense that it won't actually clip into place, but nonetheless, 
It wasn't designed for someone who's six foot three. I can get back here. It's pretty impressive. Now climb into the back of the Espada and you'll find a couple of other cool luxury features back here. For example, how about the fact that there's an ashtray for the rear passengers? Yes, there's an ashtray for the front passengers and an ashtray for the rear passengers. And there's a cigarette lighter for both front and rear. Now, as I mentioned, this back seat wasn't really designed for adults. So one wonders if Lamborghini placed the ashtray and cigarette lighter back here for the kids you would be driving around. That wouldn't have been completely out of the realm in Italy in the 70s. Start them smoking young. A couple of other interesting luxury items in the back of the Espada. Number one are the rear quarter windows. They open, but they don't roll down and they don't open with a little clip in the corner of the window like in a minivan. Instead, they open with this weird handle thing. You sort of lift it and push and then the window is open. This is a very odd design, but if you're stuck in the back of an Espada and you need a little airflow, I guess that's better than nothing. Also worth noting that little handle, well, of course, that's leather wrapped. This is the beautiful luxury Lambo. And speaking of leather, take a look at these rear seats. These are the back seats in this car probably won't get used all that often and yet look how beautifully leather stuffed they are they even have this odd leather pattern on them which by the way continues back up front another nice luxury touch in the back seat there is a light specifically for the rear passengers unfortunately in this particular espada that light isn't working which is no surprise i strongly suspect the parts to replace the rear seat light for a 1973 lamborghini espada haven't been available since i don't know probably about 1976. But this car wasn't all beautiful, well-appointed, leather-lined luxury for grand touring. At the end of the day, this car is a Lamborghini from the 70s, so it's also filled with some weird crap, starting with the control layout. Look at this thing. It's like a Honda S2000. It's tremendously driver-focused. Everything is tilted selfishly towards the driver, including the radio, which is mounted on the left side of the steering wheel. So the passenger has absolutely no access to the radio, the volume, anything that happens with the music. Now, in this giant wall of driver-focused gauges and switches, it's pretty much everything you'd expect. The oil pressure, the engine temperature, the tachometer, speedometer, the battery volts, fuel gauge. There's a little area where all the warning lights are. And then there are a couple of switches for the wipers, for the headlights. But there are a couple of unique and unusual things in here. For example, there's a light that allows you to turn off the instrument panel lights. You know how in some cars you can dim it if you're trying to drive and it's dark and you don't want the lights on you? Well, in this car you can just turn them off. Press that and they're gone. I also like that there are different switches for every single windshield wiper function. Wipe, intermittent wipe, wash the windshield. And they're right next to the switch for the headlights. I can't imagine how many times someone going for the lights has accidentally turned on the wipers in this vehicle. Now, beyond that, there are a couple of other bizarre items throughout the interior in this car. For example, the center console. The center console has two nice little storage areas. Strangely enough, one of these storage areas is covered and the other one isn't. I don't know why they didn't make the whole thing covered or the whole thing open, but you can choose whether you want to hide stuff or whether you want to keep it out in the open. Also interesting, the lever to open the hood is not underneath the dashboard like it is in most cars in the driver footwell. Instead, it's just to the left of the dashboard with an easy access, which is probably good if you have a 1970s Lamborghini. You'll probably be getting under there occasionally. Other interesting quirks in this car, maybe one of the strangest quirks in a car designed for luxury and easy rear seat access is the fact that simply accessing the rear seat by folding the front seat is rather difficult. You don't just fold the front seat with a little latch on the side of the seat that's easy to reach. Instead, for some reason, they put the latch on the opposite side of the seat, meaning that you have to reach all the way across the seat in order to fold the seat down which is very odd. Oddly, they did this on both sides. They should just switch the position of the seats in this car. Fortunately, there is a benefit to the way the seats go down, and that's the fact that they go down all the way. You can basically fold them flat. So theoretically, you could have someone driving this car and someone else in the back on the passenger side with their feet out over the folded down passenger seat. And then we must talk about the seat belts. Now, a lot of cars from this era just had lap belts. Some cars from a little bit earlier than this car had no seat belts at all. This car had shoulder belts and lap belts. It was pretty impressive, but you had to put them together. You took the shoulder belt, you put it into the lap belt, you married them together, and then you moved them across your waist and put them in the buckle. In other words, buckling your seat belt in this car was ultimately a two-step process. You couldn't just get in and throw in the buckle. And how about the reminder to fasten your seat belts? Instead of a little light in the gauge cluster, it was this warning that angrily blinked at you until you buckled up. Another weird thing about this car, something that was weird about basically every Italian car from this era, that would be the horn activated by pressing the end of the turn signal stock and then... Oh, that's, that's really annoying. 
So those are all the quirks of the Espada, and now it's time for the ultimate quirk, getting behind the wheel of the weird Lamborghini with the strange rear end that resembles a Prius. All right, driving the Espada. Boy, there's a lot of room in this cabin. You know, I've driven a couple of these vintage cars over the last few days, these vintage Italian exotics, and there's no room in any of them. This thing, I got a ton of space. I got no problems shifting. I got no problems with my legs, turning the wheel. This is great. It's actually surprisingly easy to get going. Pressing down on the clutch, it's not all that hard, which is, which is surprising. I would have expected it to be a little bit more difficult. All right, now we're letting it loose. Oh, pretty quick. Wow, it has that nice Lamborghini sound. I can just imagine grand touring through Europe and this thing back in the day, and you're on an on-ramp, you've just stopped for fuel with your family in tow, and then you just floor it and you get that noise. That would be something special. Sitting at the stoplight, this one must be in pretty nice mechanical shape. Sitting at the stoplight, uh, there's no rumbling at all. I'm really surprised by that. Italian cars from this era are always a little bit rumbly at stoplights, always a little bit annoying, but this car, feels like the luxury car that it is in that respect. It's, it's quite impressive. Uh, I don't feel any shakes or rattles or anything. Um, it's almost like the car is off. It's, it's, it's really nice. And I'm sitting here on this leather seat and the, there's no headrest in any of these old cars. They didn't think about that whole whiplash thing. They hadn't been thought of until the 80s. But, but sitting here on this leather seat, this seat is nice. It's nicely bolstered. It's soft leather. It feels good. Now we're on some like cobblestone-y type annoying little pavement here. Uh, but the car is fine. Uh, it does pretty well riding on this stuff, which is impressive. It feels like a luxury car. Woo! Boy, but that sound is wonderful. Whoa! What a great sound. It really does sound amazing. It's so funny. This does feel like the luxury touring car they were intending it to be. It seriously does. But then when you get up 4,000 RPM, <laughs> It sounds like a Lamborghini from the 60s, 70s. That's exactly it. I can't believe how roomy it is in here, how nice it feels. It feels luxurious. We give it some gas. Woo! Feels surprisingly stable in the corner, more than the Ferrari Boxer I just drove. Oh, yeah. Man, I don't know its limits, I'm a little nervous, but actually, it feels really, really stable. This is 65 miles an hour in this, in the, I mean, it's a sweeper, but still, you know, I've never driven this car before, and it's doing a great job. And I don't feel like there's no body roll. It feels very, very good. I don't feel like it's about to spin out or something's about to break and the whole car is gonna fall apart. I feel like I can do this. I can't believe just driving at 60 here on a highway. Now, all the roads in Dubai are very nice. There's not much weather to screw them up, but driving at 60 here on the highway feels like a cruiser. I mean, I feel like I could get in this thing and, and just kill miles in this car, just hundreds and hundreds of miles, all while getting seven and a half miles per gallon. I wouldn't say this car is agile in the corners. It's a pretty large vehicle. I don't know the length, but uh, I'll look it up. And so it doesn't feel agile. It feels relatively heavy. The steering is heavy. However, it feels very stable. I've always kind of wondered who bought the Espada, you know? What kind of crazy person was buying one of those? Uh, but I can understand now. I mean, it's still a weird car and it's still a weird Lamborghini and all that. But I can just, I can imagine being, you know, in the 70s and you want a Lamborghini that doesn't draw all the attention like the Mira, but you still want something cool that sounds amazing. This car is certainly that. It's very special. So that's the 1973 Lamborghini Espada. It's not exactly what you think of when you think of Lamborghini, and that has kept values down. While Miras are now selling for a million dollars, this would struggle to bring a quarter of that. And yet, this is the last word in Lamborghini exclusivity. Everyone has a Mira. Go to a car show and they're wall-to-wall -wall Miras, and everybody thinks the Mira is cool, but this is much rarer, and nobody knows what this is. Nobody's ever seen one of these things. It's so unusual and so bizarre. Plus, all those Mura people, yeah, they can't drive around with their spouse and their kids and their pets. And with that in mind, it's time to give this car a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, I'm not gonna lie here, the Espada is weird looking. Really weird looking. It's an acquired taste and most car enthusiasts haven't acquired it and it gets a 4 out of 10. Next up is acceleration. The Espada does 0 to 60 in 7.5 seconds. Not great by modern standards, but acceptable in its day, and it gets a 1 out of 10. 
Handling is good, way better than most cars from this era, and it feels rock solid and stable at high speeds. It gets a 6 out of 10. Cool factor is high. It is, after all, a rare vintage Lamborghini, but it's prevented from reaching the very top scores because nobody really knows what it is. Still, it gets an 8 out of 10. Importance is a bit different. It's an important car in the sense that it's a V12 classic Lamborghini, but most car people I talk to, even knowledgeable ones, have no real idea this thing even exists. It's no Mira, and it gets only a 6 out of 10. That brings the total weekend score to 25 out of 50. On to the daily categories, and features. The Espada was well equipped for its time, but obviously it's weak by modern standards and it gets a 2 out of 10. Comfort is better than I expected with a roomy interior and well equipped seats, but it's no Rolls Royce. Still, it's better than any rival from this era and it gets a 6 out of 10. Quality is a mixed bag. Interior quality is high, but reliability, well, I wouldn't want to maintain this thing and it gets a 5 out of 10. Practicality is surprisingly good. It has four usable seats and a shockingly large cargo area. It's held back only by poor gas mileage and questionable daily usability, and it gets a 4 out of 10. Finally, value. This is a manual transmission V12 vintage Lamborghini that isn't absolutely insanely priced. It's going to go up, and it's a good car that's fun to drive. It gets a 7 out of 10, bringing the total daily score to 24 out of 50. Add it all up, and the total Doug score score is 49 out of 100, which is weak but standard for a car from this time. It comes just one point shy of the Ferrari Boxer, which was a little better looking and more fun to drive, but far less comfortable and usable.